Hi everyone, it's uh, Grant Abbott speaking and I am here with uh, both uh, Michael Jeffries and also Tim Munro. So um, how are you both gentlemen? I think Tim's a bit muted at the moment. He'll come on a little bit later on, but uh, how are you, uh, Michael? Fantastic, Grant. Uh, good morning all. Yeah, so I know you do a lot of, um, you obviously uh, help us out at Lightyear Group and you're a director and do all our capital raising, our CFO, you're a man of uh, all body, so to speak. Um, and uh, you've got a lot, so we're going to be looking a little bit later on in terms of the PPSR and also getting the relevant, um, ensuring that we get uh, the relevant uh, PPSR registration, mortgages, so on and so forth. So uh, we'll be tuning into you a little bit later on, but uh, I know you've used the protector a couple of times. How are you finding it? Uh, it's, it's a fantastic product. I mean, there's, there's nothing else currently in the marketplace um, available that... Um, protects um, clients, uh, personal and uh, business and uh, other assets. Um, I know, we were talking about it the other day and I was just like so super surprised when um, I know uh, every trust that I've ever been involved with, uh, there's uh, UPEs, etc., cetera, and um, hardly any of them are secured, which seems to be dangerous, particularly if it's a trading trust. And look, passive trusts are completely different, but a trading trust that... You know, not to have those UPEs secured at any instance is a bit of a worry. No, I mean, and we see, I mean, not only UPEs, but uh, director loans, shareholder loans that are sitting there that um, are unsecured as well. And um, we'll discuss it later, but um, there's a lot of uh, importance around the actual documentation and the registration and the timing of that. So. Okay, cool. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. Um, I, uh, I got first involved with this capital protection strategy using capital protection trust through... Shane Ellis, who's an excellent lawyer up on the Gold Coast, still around, does some great work. Um, Shane uh, had the Capital Protection Trust and um, I did it myself uh, for my business. And I must admit, there was a, a big flurry of documents and really it was, a, again, a gift loan back strategy. And congrats to Shane for, you know, for introducing me uh, to, to me to that. It certainly did a great wonders for my business and, and took uh, the weight off my shoulders around asset protection. Um, I, I must admit, though, when I did, I didn't go in depth or didn't do a deep dive into the capital protection trustee, uh, all of that sort of stuff. But uh, that, that doesn't matter. It was, uh, it was a viable tool of that sort of stuff. It was just, looks at the end of the day, it was smart and simple. Um, um, then Tim Munro got in touch with me probably around about maybe four months ago. Um, Tim's uh, obviously does a lot of work uh, with us at uh, Lightyear Group. Uh, is also a shareholder in the group as well, as is, is Michael. And uh, Tim showed me, he said, look, you know, he'd been doing this uh, protector or uh, gift loan back strategy through a couple of legal firms who are charging anywhere between 4000 to 6000 which um, Tim's the best salesman in the world, and he'll tell you that one. Um, and uh, even with his margin on top, it gets very difficult to do that. So um, he went through, and we went through the... Uh, particular issues and the documentation that was required. And as, as soon as he told me all the documentation, I said, well, I've actually got all of this up on the Lightyear Doc site. It just, uh, it's all in different little places. There's six or seven documents. Uh, and uh, so it's very easy to package up and put together. But at Lightyear Group, we're not about that. We don't just allow you to go and pick and choose and all that. One is from a compliance perspective, and I'll be having a chat with Tony very shortly on the the, the trail is that if you get the document in the wrong time, you get the execution at the wrong time, the whole thing falls to pieces. And you can see that there's been a number of cases around this, which I want to talk about uh, with Tony very shortly. So the important thing is to get that documentation right. The beautiful thing about an automation is that uh, one is that it saves huge amounts of time. So it'll probably save at least 70 or 80 percent of your time. It also means that we can, um, you know, package it up into a, a lot cheaper uh, product. It's like a, you know, a, a big meal deal, um, big protected deal, so to speak. Uh, but more importantly, it's compliant because it's all in a line. You have to do A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. Whereas if you went and started to pick and choose from um, everywhere else, you'd be doing maybe an E before a B, and then something the whole thing falls to pieces. Particularly if and you know the whole thing about the protector is asset protection never gets triggered. Uh, the relevant um, uh, other parties or the counterparties who are going to look and try to unpick that transaction 
uh, effectively are going to uh, look at make sure that it was all done correctly. So we need to make sure we execute and do everything as well. Uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that um, everything is safe, uh, certain, secure, and uh, that's uh, that's essentially our motto at uh, Lightyear Docs. Uh, essentially, this is uh, where we're going to. Is um, you've you've heard me talk about this in the last you know probably year or so. Is uh, we're seeing more and more the case where our clients really want protection from their, in fact, I just got off the phone from a, a case, an estate planning case, where um, uh, the mother has an estranged son um, and wants to give monies to her daughter, and it's in the SMSF, um, but if it goes into the estate, obviously the estranged son is gonna have a challenge, and certainly will not, you know, there'll, there'll be a plethora of lawyers which will um, be able to attack that. For that one, uh, what we do is my suggestion around that building that mode is to push it, make sure it doesn't go to the estate uh, so that we end up building an uh, SMSF Death Benefits Trust, which is a testamentary trust that is actually sparked by an SMSF will. Not your will, by the SMSF will. So it has the power, the force of the CIS Act and also the Commonwealth Crimes Act. So I, I like doing that sort of stuff to, to help build the moat. Uh, and likewise, for all of you who've got your uh, trusts, I mean, that's uh, just 101. So we've got our Family Protection Trust, or which we call our leading member trust there, which really localises um, uh, appointors, trustees, beneficiaries um, to our bloodline or our lineage. Um, it really keeps things tight. And, and that, to me, is, is, a, is a great uh, trust. Uh, but we also got to have a clients with a lot of trading trusts, which inherently have businesses that we can open to litigation. You never know what the tax office can come in and do. Um, you never know what asset can come in and do. So once that's open up, then the assets are, are really um, subject to attack. So again, we need to um, look at a, a, a difference between a family protection trust versus a, a trading trust. What do we do with bucket companies, which have got quite sizable potentially uh, loan backs or even under the new rules, Div 7A loans going back to uh, family trusts. So we've got to be really careful about that. Um, and then we've got a lot of clients who unfortunately, it'd be great, for example, with uh, shares in their business if it's through a, um, a company rather than the family trust uh, for those shares to be held by that family protection trust. Uh, but it hasn't been set up that way, so it's in their own name. So again, they're exposed um, individually if, uh, one, there's litigation, again, if there's family provisions, uh, if the regulator takes an action or someone takes an action against them. Um, and look, who knows what's going to happen out of this uh, COVID. There's going to be a lot of litigation that will be flying around from that perspective. Um, and likewise, we've all got, obviously, our houses in our own name or in joint names, uh, mainly so we can get the principal place of residence exemption. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that we uh, essentially want to have in our own name. Uh, it might be by mistake, uh, but really the, uh, we'd love to have it inside a, a family protection trust or one of these leading member trusts. But it's very difficult to get in because we might, for example, in a principal place of residence exemption, you're going to lose that exemption once it's in there. Um, secondly, we want to keep it outside, but if we've got those shares in the bucket company and there's quite sizable, um, quite sizable assets in there, to move it in, obviously there's going to be a capital gains tax issue as well. Um, not stamps, but there'll be potentially stamp issues if we've got uh, properties, etc. So we know we've got this this twist there that a client comes to us as probably being from a different accountant for a different firm and we have a look across the the whole thing and it might be set up perfectly from a tax perspective but at the end of the day it might be an absolute disaster for an asset protection uh, perspective and it's not only asset protection during life in fact there's three stages one is there's asset protection during um, our cognitive life um, then there's asset protection in the event that we lose our mental capacity. And then finally, asset protection in the event that we die. And you can't just leave one without the other. We need to look at it all encompassing. And again, we've got, we want to build that moat as large as possible. And more importantly, see who the dangerous hordes are who are coming in to attack. Now, when they attack, they don't attack just as of right. Um, there is a plethora of lawyers who come out and obviously attack these sort of things uh, right from the start. So I think that that is uh, absolutely crucial. So what it looks like in, in its base form 
uh, is that uh, what we've got is uh, a client, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit further about other assets and all that, and I know Tim's got a few stories there for us. But uh, in essence, what we do is we look for the net equity uh, that we have in a range of assets. And that could be, for example, the, the bucket company, it could be investments, you can see here, it could be a, a motor vehicle, uh, it could be a principal place of residence, it could be a range of investment properties. Now, what we do is we don't transfer those in. I mean, ideally, we could transfer shares in. Um, if there was no CGT issue, then I would go straight through and, and um, uh, transfer the shares in. Now, you can see on the left-hand side here, um, the, the Family Protection Trust or the Leading Member Trust um, again, it's a passive style because it doesn't make sense um, transferring the equity by way of a gift over into one of these trusts um, if it then is a business trust. And, and again, all you're doing is you're actually putting um, a fuel on the fire. So it's the last thing that essentially you want. Now, if you've got an existing uh, family trust or a discretionary trust, which is a passive one, we can gift it in there. Now, what we want to do is upgrade the underlying governing rules um, probably also upgrade definitely the corporate trustee. So they're all in this line. They're all focused in on protection, asset protection for um, bloodline and also uh, beneficiaries and lineage. So that, that's easy. And there's uh, a commissioner's guidelines on saying that um, if you do upgrade um, these discretionary trusts, uh, effectively there is uh, not a resettlement, uh, which is quite quite interesting it's not a resettlement there's no capital gains tax so you can either go and, and you'll see with our protector a little bit later on we can either uh, build a um, a builder trust um, through our protector uh, which is again a leading member or slash family protection trust um, or alternatively we can then upgrade our an existing trust that we've got my preference is if it's a sizable thing is to actually go clean and set one um, straight up and so it's it's not imbued with anything um, else so what we do is we look at the net equity there. Um, this is uh, from our individual. Uh, you can do it obviously jointly, which is okay. Uh, you can do it from bucket companies inside. You can do it from existing family trusts if you want. You can do it from UPEs as Mike will talk a little bit later on. So we gift the equity of that over to the trust. Now, when you gift, you have to understand once you do a gift, for example, a lot of us, well, some of us may well be making deductible gifts uh, prior to 30 June. Now, if I gave a gift to the RSPCA, uh, I can't go and claim it back. A gift is a gift is a gift. And provided you've got a good, strong deed of gift, there is no clawback. You see, in, for example, um, in a Tayer's case uh, where there was um, a loan or it wasn't a loan, it was sort of like this umbrella sort of uh, loan uh, or amounts that have been lent, et cetera. Uh, it was argued that uh, effectively it was a sham transaction. But if you've got a, a proper data gift, um, then effectively that's it. So once it's over, it now sits, or that equity now sits inside that family protection trust. From that though, is you can't just gift equity over, you have to do it by way of some form. And what we do is we use uh, promissory notes and usually long dated promissory notes. For those of you on my session yesterday, promissory notes are the best thing ever inside self-managed super funds for those last minute contributions. If you haven't got the cash all, you can use a promissory note. The same with minimum pension payments. If you haven't got cash, you can use a promissory note. So promissory notes are equivalent to cash, equivalent to a check. Um, and certainly again, we've got to make sure that our legal documentation is, is right on point. So we transfer that in and then this is the important point. So everything now sits with the trustee or the Family Protection Trust. So we need to make sure um, that when we do this, just to give you a heads up, is that the um, first appointor, which we call the leading member family protection appointor, um, that person controls the whole box and dice. They can hire and fire the trustees, they can get rid of beneficiaries, they can do whatever they want. Now, the big issue there is uh, who's actually going to take control after they retired or alternatively they're incapacitated or they die, or more importantly, if they're getting attacked personally, um, whether it's through the family court, whether it's through litigation, they need to peel out of there and not be part of that trust anymore. So we need to have that succession planning, which is really the skill of building one of these trusts. Now, what will happen is in order to still avail themselves, our, our happy guy there, which looks a bit like Prince Andrew, so it's probably not the best photo, photo stock uh, image at all, but he's very happy, obviously. 
uh, not like Prince Andrew, but um, what we need to do is have a, a genuine loan agreement from the trust um, down to the individual's concern. Mm -hmm. And that loan needs to be uh, secured, which is absolutely crucial um, out of that, that whole process there. Um, so the, the target clients for the, the protector, I mean, when you think about it, um, so Michael Papadrea, promissory notes for good for C. In fact, um, Michael, look, you're also super smart, but you're from the ACT. Um, CGT rollover into super. Maybe if you want to give me a call a little bit later on, Michael, um, you must use a promissory note. Um, if you try to do it by way of an asset, in fact, um, there's... Uh, Unfortunately, because the way the CGT rollover rules work is that um, effectively there has to be a payment. So um, I did uh, CGT rollovers years ago, and again, promissory notes was uh, front and centre. It's absolutely crucial for CGT rollover. But I don't want to get distracted, so Michael, give me a call later on. Um, now, uh, the perfect client for the protector, uh, basically any professional. Uh, I mean, gosh, if I was an auditor, um, I, the first thing I'll be doing is getting rid of all my assets into the protector. Um, if you have a look at Cam and Bear and, uh, and McGoldrick and also Baumgartner's case, uh, plus I've got the next one there, you know, section 52, 52A, B, 54B, C and 55.3. Basically, again, while anyone who's dealing with self-managed super funds, there's a statutory strict liability to sue anyone who's breached a rule of the governing, you know, a, a rule of the deed, the investment strategy, Anything, um, members or trustees have a statutory right to sue you um, and you can't use the, the law of negligence as opposed to obviously Cam and Bear and, and Baldwin in this case. So if you're in the SMSFs, absolutely. The first thing you should do is get the protector, get rid of absolutely everything. Um, in terms of uh, anyone who has uh, been involved with, uh, what's got a second marriage, Absolutely, we need to use the protector. And there's a couple of cases we'll look at that a little bit later on so that the assets, again, are sitting in that family protection trust. So we've got to be very careful uh, about that one as well. Um, although you can't always guarantee, obviously, with family law. Builders, subcontractors, obviously any director, freelance worker, IT, if there's disasters, doctors, nurses, dentists, um, engineers, um, uh, if you have a look at now, obviously accountants, uh, financial planning professionals, anyone who's got a potential to be sued, obviously it's the first one you want to go. Um, smaller be medium business owner, look, I'm virtually putting everyone in the world because then you've got the other side is that, a, again, I can tell you, um, Tony and I, and in fact, I'll, I might get um, Tony on um, now. And we'll have a look. Are you there, Tony? Yeah, I'm here. How are you? Good, good. Um, I, I must admit, you and I, we do a lot of um, estate planning for clients. Um, and quite often when we get halfway through and we find um, a lot of uh, clients are happy families, which is fantastic. So we still go through, yeah. we go through the process, doing testamentary trust. But then um, we find now and then those cases where there's been second marriages, uh, strange children, um, so on and so forth that you and I generally look at each other we think oh my god this shouldn't go into an estate at all it needs to actually yeah. go into a protector so I think that uh, that's probably what I mean by the time we see cases it's usually 50% of them are, are pretty disastrous anyway that's why uh, accountants and planners come to us but you know what's your experience you, you're probably exactly the same around the protector yeah absolutely um, <clears throat> look what um um, so we know that um, we're just coming back very quickly to the um, to the gift and loan back um, scenario. Is that um, these types of arrangements can be effective where there is a need to manage risk or otherwise remove the value of the asset out of um, one's individual name, and this is commonly used for high risk individuals that own assets in their own name or as part of an estate planning strategy to minimise assets forming part of the estate of the person's estate, naturally. However... You probably, sorry to jump in there, it's probably, you nailed it there actually, is um, the, the term high risk. I would actually yeah. probably even, um, given the fact, I mean, you, we were having a chat yesterday, how many new lawyers are bouncing onto the market in Victoria? And, and the market is pretty stuffed after COVID, but how many lawyers did you say were, were um, just uh, admitted? 
there were in Victoria there were 140 lawyers that were, were, were have been admitted in the last two weeks. I know, and that's that's I, crazy. I, I mean, they've got to do crazy. something. That's crazy. Um, I don't know where these young kids are going to find work or what they're going to do at the end of the day, but it's um, um, it's um, it's a little bit disappointing. But uh, after a hundred grand's worth of hex, I think um, I don't know how the hell they're going to pay it back either. So yeah, well, that's gonna... that's where that litigation comes in, and I think that if you get a good litigation case, so you're talking about high risk. I I, I would look at um, if, if I could have a look at myself or yourself or anyone who's on the call today. If there's a 50-50 risk, I'd be going to protect her, maybe even less, because it's better to be safe than sorry. Because we all know that once you get into a litigation fight, you're looking, what, two or three years of your life, the stress, the concern, um, and that that just, well, look, you've been involved in quite a few from the litigation side, and I, you're always telling me that it's best to settle, but quite often they don't settle because it's a feast for lawyers. No, that's right. Exactly. They don't want to settle. They just want to go in for the kill in the courts and do a five, six, seven day trial, you know, rack up some fees of a hundred over 200 grand. And, um, and at the end of it, nobody's a winner, not the client, neither is the, well, the plaintiff or defendant. And, um, you know, and the, and the real winners, as you know, uh, are the lawyers. Exactly. Yeah. Now, in uh, Pelly, Pelly and Nolan, which is an interesting case, that was a family yeah. uh, law case where the um, father had um, supposedly lent uh, $500,000 uh, to a son. Uh, $300,000 of it was uh, by way of a loan agreement. The other $200,000 were just bits and bobs and here and there, which is not bad. I wish my dad had some bits and bobs to, to give to me. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the family court looked at it and because it was a binding uh, loan agreement, um, that effectively from that perspective, even though there'd been no interest paid on it, uh, they held that it was a valid loan agreement not forming matrimonial property. Whereas the other amount of uh, money that was sitting there basically uh, was left out, uh, left outside and effectively uh, was caught up in the family court as matrimonial property. And again, it goes down to um, obviously the, the documentation concern, which is also the case in Adia. So do you want to give us a bit of a, a, yeah. a bit of a diatribe on yeah. uh, Adia and also documentation? Adia. Yeah, no, Adia was, um, well, this is the probably the leading case, I guess, on, um, on gift and loan backs, you know, it was uh, 2011, it was in the Queensland Supreme Court. Um, this doc here is, he was a, he's a surgeon. Um, um, entered into a gift and loan back style arrangement with his mum. Um, the doc then argued when his mother subsequently called in the dead Jew to what as his mother's disapproval of the relationship. And then the loan mortgage was not intended to be actually binding, they're saying, and was only a pretense to protect against situations where the doc was sued professionally. It's um, quite interesting. So, uh, because the the doc was the the mortgage was actually for a million bucks, but the the yeah, amounts uh, want... weren't even anywhere near that. Yeah. Um, so, um, unfortunately, the uh, the court found all aspects of the legal documentation, including the deed, the loan agreement, and the registered mortgage, had been validly prepared and executed, and there was no mistake or sham involved. And as a result of that, the um, the doctor's mother was unable was able to call in the debt. So, what this case demonstrates, or what really Atia and, and Pally's case demonstrates, is that um, it shows the importance of not only um, you need to prepare proper documentation, but the need for a regular review of the circumstances to ensure. Um, whether the documents need to be varied or topped up, so to speak, to take into account any further advances. That's what um, it means. Yeah, so the execution is really important. I know that's part of um, your um, developing a, a, legal, a letter of advice around use of the protector and also the execution. Uh, how far is that off, Tony? No, that's uh, we're about a, week's, a week out of that now. So what we can do once um, we've finalised it and have signed it off, um, then there's two options, I guess, at the end of the day. Is one is um, 
get you know uh, any potential advisors that want access to the um, letter of advice, um, there'll be a small fee attached to that. Otherwise, if you want Abbott and Morley to do the whole thing, um, the documents, the gift and loan back, the loan agreement, etc., um, and provide the letter of and the signed letter of advice off, then um, there'll be um, a 70-30 split on that, basically. Perfect. I mean, obviously, you need a lot of work on that one. Yeah. So thanks for that. Um, we'll uh, we'll be in touch with everyone anyway. But uh, look, it, it's it's pretty exciting, I I think, from that perspective, because the more and more we see clients, uh, the more it actually sort of fits in there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in uh, Tim. Are you there, Tim? Oh, I just wanted to talk about the bankruptcy provisions, mate. Oh yeah, sorry. Just uh, yeah, go. I forgot about the bankruptcy. That's pretty yeah, important. That, that's important because just sorry, Tim. Just let me very quickly so everybody gets an understanding. And that's okay. I'm enjoying listening to you. Oh, thank you. See, the arrangement has been these types of arrangements have been subject to some scrutiny over the years, right? Yeah. Um, Particularly under Section One Twenty. Yeah. So making it very critical that. Um, specific advice be sought from you know your advisor whether it's Abbott or Morley or or from some other legal firm but um, the biggest areas that come under fire are the issues with bankruptcy right and the major provisions are under section 120 and 121 now section 120 and section uh, section 120 sorry allows a trustee in bankruptcy to overturn transfers of property at less than market value or undervalued transactions by a person who subsequently becomes a bankrupt where the transaction occurs up to five years prior to the bankruptcy subject to some, to some exemptions. Now, the most important exemption is this. One of the exemptions relates to the transfers to related entities um, where the transfer took place more than four years before the commencement of the bankruptcy provided that the transferee proves that at the time of the transfer, the transferee was in, was solvent at the time. So you can't do it after the fact or else you're gone. Yeah. You've got to do it before the fact, right? And make sure that, you know, you're solvent at the time when the transaction is um, is executed. And it's Particularly going to be it's a gift, obviously, it's going to be undervalued. Exactly. So um, that's, um, that's 120. Now, however, this is not the only way that the main purpose requirement can be satisfied. So under section 121 is not subject to any time limits. That's defeating, if you're trying to defeat the creditors for any purpose, yeah. well, there's no time limits there, you're finished. Particularly okay. in COVID, you think, you know, if you try to just put that in now, you'd, you'd be pretty well stuffed. Uh, yeah. Because obviously if there's, insolvency or trying to defeat your creditors, you're going to be pretty well caught. Oh, you're going to be caught because you know what liquidators and official trustees in bankruptcy are like. I've dealt with them before for many years. Very and, nasty. Then, and then and then the, they're the real deal, basically, these guys. <laughs> right? oh, nice. They're the uh, real deal, you know. They're um, actually, work, if I could say anything, they're actually worse than family lawyers. Oh, um, forget so, that, you know. Yeah, cool. But, um, in practice, the longer the period between the transaction and the date of bankruptcy, it's more difficult. It may be for the trustee in bankruptcy to establish the, res the reservoir uh, purpose, bearing in mind that it is the trustee in bankruptcy who has the onus of proof. Yeah, exactly. 121. Simple as that. Cool. So it might appear that Section 121 would defeat any asset protection strategy that involves the transfer of funds or property to a related party if one of the uh, motives of the client in implementing this strategy is to protect assets in the event of bankruptcy. Yeah, and I think the, I think the important point is that obviously family provisions we're comfortable with, um, we're comfortable with litigation, protection, uh, stuff like that, that you know, if anyone's got a concern, uh, just simply they can contact you, Tanner Morris, um, at uh, abbottmorley.com.au um, yep. And then effectively what we can do is we can go through and have a look. So I, I think yep. that's crucial. And um, again, it's just part of the Lightyear Doc service. If it's simple, then, you know, we're happy to give you that advice. If it's a big ticket item, you need something a bit more detailed, as Tony said, then we can actually provide a specific advice for you. So well, one, um, of the, one of the areas there, just jumping in, Grant, yeah. and Tony, so is that, um, yeah. obviously gifting is uh, there's undervalued and stuff, but 
where we get around a lot of that, um, which I'll discuss later, but um, is through uh, the use of uh, external valuations. So if we're mm-hmm. trans, so if we're restructuring or it's related relating to loans or uh, other assets, we'll get uh, an external valuation from an accountant who's not uh, the client's accountant. Um, yeah. And uh, we obviously have a panel of friendlies who can provide values for different purposes. But um, then, then as long as it's a market, as Tony alluded to, then uh, you don't have any issues. And obviously, yeah. as long as the timing matches up as well. And also, one other thing that I've been analysing out of all this transaction, I've been doing some, you know, I've been reviewing all this stuff for the past weeks uh, to make sure to get it correct, is um, how, how are we going to um, reflect this into the... Um, in, from an accounting point of view, that's the question. So when the when you eventually transfer the equity across to the trust, how will that look? How will that look un, um, under um, under the financial statements? Basically, how will it show up? Because everything's got to marry up at the end of the day. Yeah, know? correct. Exactly. We might we might look at that for Michael and. What I'll do is hand over now to, because I know Tim's itching to do it because he's doing lots of them at the moment. So I would say he's probably out of, in Australia, the most experienced accountant, uh, et cetera, dealing with this on a face-to-face right in the, the, the right of the uh, trenches. So Tim, if you want to jump on and um, just look at the, the issues there. So I'd like to, you know, who's your target client, um, your discussion points, your engagement letter, proposed fees. So Maybe if you could address a lot of those uh, issues on and just talk us uh, through, because uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, people on here, you know, just how, how as best as possible. Yeah, sure, Grant. Look, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. I always listen to your sessions every Thursday, and um, I know that our team, you know, listens to the recordings, and it's, it's, it's great stimulation for, for thinking. And um, when you started doing these sessions in July last year, uh, I was uh, listening and just got me thinking about all aspects of our clients and our business. And I've been a really big accountant for looking at asset protection as the foundation for everything we do. If you get the asset protection right, you actually end up getting good tax effectiveness at the same time. And it's taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Uh, I say to our clients, look, it's great. You've got a really good business. You're making all this money. But, you know, if you're hit by a truck, and you're no longer there. Or if your 18 year old kid is in a relationship that goes bad and you or mum die, all of a sudden they get this money, half of it goes somewhere else to another family that your family now hates. What is the point of all the hard work and all the sweat and tears that you've done up until now? And you know, some clients, uh, like not all, but some clients do have a bit of a, a go about fees and things like that. But having a crack about a five grand fee when compared to losing $2 million worth of equity and other things like that, it's, it's just irrelevant. So it's really helping. You need to talk to your clients and help them see the bigger picture. And when they see the bigger picture and they understand the value with what you're recommending, I find that every single client I talk to, this all of a sudden becomes something urgent for them to do. So it's, it's, it's helping. We've got a process within Change GPS called VPP, which stands for Value, Plan and Price. So every time we have a chat with a client, uh, and we've actually put together, it's, it's actually a 25-page letter, which encompasses um, everything that Grant has got on Lightyear Docs. Um, and we're going to build an app so we can help accounts actually sell the front end and then go straight through to Grant's Lightyear system to actually create these amazing documents because what we're finding is if we can engage the client really well up front, help them see the value, they'll always go ahead and they'll never argue about the price. So the value point of view is like what I described earlier. Um, you know, clients got a business, they've got equity in properties. Even if they don't think they've got a match, they might have a couple hundred thousand equity in the family home, but mum and dad normally have half a million, a million dollars worth of life cover. So if they both died, you're looking at a state two to three mil for an average mum and dad. So that's an, a, a big amount of money that needs to be looked after for their kids or whoever they want it to go to. So we talk about this, we talk about the potential for that to go and clients are always concerned. And then I always talk about, you want to keep your wealth in your family bloodline. So the rules are important parts, but protect that. Um, you know, every client's got properties. So when we talk to them about 
not just the will, but we want to have um, your your equity in your properties protected in a way with the right trusts so your family members are hardwired into those trusts and nothing can tear that apart. And I use that word hardwired into the documents and clients just love it, Grant. Yeah. So, and that's what you've got in your leading member documents. Um, so if anyone here hasn't looked and really got your head around the leading member trusts and constitutions for the trustee companies, you've got to do that so you can understand just how amazing this is. Um, because you've got those a, solid... A, yeah, yeah, I think it's also, I know you're at the forefront, I know Michael is as well as the, um, you know, the, the days of compliance. I know accounts are so super busy at the moment with compliance, but effectively when you're doing compliance, you're really just acting as the, you know, commissioner's, uh, well, not agent, but, you know, you're doing stuff that um, com clients don't necessarily care, compare about. But I just wanted to pick up that issue you were saying is that, you um, the, the key words or the key phrases or the, the thematic that you have mm. where, where clients become super motivated around this, the protection of the bloodline. That's the key. Like when I say, look, you want to keep your wealth in your bloodline and explain that it can be done. A lot of clients say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. I say, yep, you can. You can have it written in the documents and you can make certain that using something like the protector, you can actually have your equity automatically in a leading member trust, we call them family protection mm. trusts, yep. automatically in there and no one can fight about that. And they go, wow, that's that helps me sleep better at night. And so it's, it's just getting those touch points with clients. And you're right, this is when it's, it's going, you know, it's not the compliance, it's going beyond that. Uh, it's going into something that your clients really want. So a big thing for everyone listening today is please do not assume that your clients don't want this. Do not assume that your clients don't want to pay for it. Even though times are tough at the moment and they might have, mightn't have as much cash. Um, there's ways you can get your clients to pay for this. Um, and we use quick fee or other things if clients want to pay it off over time. But I've never had an issue with the client paying up front for this work when they understand the value of it, Grant. So it's important so, that you do this so price do, Yeah, so when you do your, 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 your pricing uh, mechanism, do you look at it um, on a scale of, of the equity that is actually protected or is it just some other uh, mechanism? No, so a couple of things. Every time we start this process, most of our clients don't have a leading member trust. Like we could upgrade an existing trust, but you just don't know what the skeletons are yeah. in the closet. So I always say, look, you've got to start. And, and the, the, the letter that we've put together, which will actually turn into an app, um, and I love it just to kind of push a button and link straight to Lightyear. So it's a different question crap we have to take. Mm -hmm. But um, what, what we do is we say, look, you need to have the leading member discretion trust set up, the leading member company um, trustee, and we charge three grand plus GST for that. That's the starting point. And then to do a protector uh, for the client, we will charge per property five to 6,000 bucks. So we don't charge a sliding scale on equity. So, but that's a probably pretty good idea. But I've just made it either five or six thousand. Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated with what we need to do for the client. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the standard price that we charge. Which is pretty typical of what uh, most legal firms charge anyway. Yeah, the thing is that uh, the documents you put together are exceptionally good. That's why we're using them. And the process is, is exceptionally good. And there's, there's, it's not just signing off on the documents, but I'm sure you cover later. It's getting the um, second mortgage registered. It's getting all the other bits and pieces. There's, there's a few little fiddly bits that need to be done. So the, the documentation part, you've made it really easy for us. Um, and obviously, you know, like I did two of these uh, two days ago and had to sit down with the clients, had to do their ID and photo photograph it and a few little things like that, that to assist the process. But um, exceptionally valuable. And the clients, once they finish signing off the docs, you should see the relief on their face. This is one of the yeah. most important documents they feel that they have signed. So yeah. um, we're, we're rolling out to every... We're offering to every single one of our clients, Grant. We're just yeah. slowly going to me, To me, it's actually more important than a will, personally, because it covers yeah. you during life in that incapacity and after death. Whereas, you know, will is... Now, look, you've heard me talk about wills. I can't believe it that all these lawyers draft up wills and then you've got lawyers on the other side who then attack them. So what's the, <laughs> what's the purpose of that? Anyway, thanks uh, a lot for that, Tim. Much appreciated. And again, I, I know uh, you give a lot to the industry. It's great. And 
Uh, I'll hand over to Michael. I know, Michael, you do a lot of... Uh, thanks for that. I know, Michael, you do a lot of stuff around this um, asset protection and the process. And, uh, look, we've developed, uh, uh, particularly in Queensland, part of the pack is that it throws out the uh, relevant mortgage documents, which can then be uh, sent off to a solicitor for registration, which is absolutely crucial. Uh, but we get, you know, questions all the time about PPSR and all of that. So... You know, I think that security issue is is essentially where uh, I know you and Rod have done a lot of work on this. And uh, if you just want to talk us through that and, and give us a bit of background. 100%. I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with Tim uh, any more than what he's uh, just said. Um, I mean, when when I'm doing, uh, bringing on a new client, um, in, in particular, I guess, in the, in the accounting consultancy perspective, the first thing I do look at and uh, draw up is their structure and look at their risk areas and um, and and what documentation is there. So um, and 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 that's where you can really, as Tim alluded to, add real value that's um, perceived by the client. Um, and 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 as Grant mentioned, you know, it's, it's not the compliance client. Clients often leave accountants to other accounts or. or displeased with their accountants because of um, they're just doing compliance work. They never hear from them and they never add them any value to what uh, they have. So the, it's a big step to do that. And um, it's fantastic what Tim said. So yeah, as Grant uh, mentioned, um, I, I, I wear a number of hats uh, on companies I'm on. And uh, one of those is a asset uh, risk protection business. And um, it works, uh, I'd say predominantly 99% of its business is from referrals with um, accountants, financial planners, mortgage brokers, and other advisors. And, um, and it's a two-way stream in which um, they refer clients who generally may need to look at um, asset or risk protection due to um, potential um, creditor, or, and, and what I often, I use, usually term the creditor and predator issues which um, can be ATO, other creditors um, and uh, the like. And so we, we work with those advisors in terms of their clients, we engage them. We have a team based in uh, New South Wales and a team in Queensland that does uh, the, the work. Um, I just provide a bit of consultancy into that business. But um, so we'll work with those accountants. Um, they, they, they maintain and manage the client and um, they, if there's work that, uh, say, for structuring, for example, uh, let's say Tim passed on a client, then we, we actually go back to that account and get them to do that work. So, um, and we also use another, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a group of them in terms of doing valuations. Um, uh, if there's finance needed, uh, we have finance and funding solutions, but um, if they need finance, so, and, and, and that ensures that that accountant or advisor maintains that relationship. So that, that business does, um, so Ventum Optimum does um, work around securing director and shareholder loans, UPEs, which we're about to talk to, creditor and creditor negotiations, um, we protect assets and de-risk. We restructure uh, in some cases we do. We have a panel of liquidators we deal with, um, some that are more friendly, I guess, than others, you can say, but uh, we have to deal with a panel of them. Um, we've, we've had a large amount of success just last week. Um, I see, I was going to say, uh, see, such a, th such a thing. <laughs> yeah, there is. We, we, just last week, we had uh, a client who had a $1.3 million direct loan uh, that we were managed to settle for 10000 It was oh, a wow. company with a We don't, um, as I've mentioned there, so we work for the clients, not against your clients. Um, as Grant discussed earlier, the problem, I mean, liquidators are working for the creditors. That's the hands down. Um, and But we, we try to get the clients back into a position that hopefully they don't have to go into liquidation. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it's uh, we just can't do anything about it. But we try to manage that process and protect them as best we can, whether it's using products such as the protector, which is fantastic, like I mentioned, and also using um, tools such as... Um, the PPSR, so using light year documents. Um, and then there's a num number of documents we use that we're in the process of getting, um, which I've spoken to Grant about, we'll get up on light year docs. Um, but um, so we we utilize those documents to protect uh, UPEs and director loans. Um, so yes, it's possible to secure them. Um, the most important things as which Tim said, uh, Grant said, and even Tony said, is documentation. So it's important to have the right documentation. Um, and it's important to secure that documentation and that transaction. Um, and 
there's certain timing in relation to when you actually put that into place. Pre PPSR, PPP, I should say the PPSA. So um, it was 45 days. Um, depending on the type of transaction and uh, what you're actually securing, there's different timelines. But um, and and also depending if you're talking about a client who potentially may be facing creditor or predator um, actions. Um, but generally, I mean, if, if you refer to say UPE that's going to a bucket company, um, you're referring to there's a uh, reference in the Corporations Act and it has to be within 20, da 20 days of it becoming enforceable. So effectively, that would be uh, when that beneficiary becomes entitled to that um, uh, distribution or that UPE. Um, so is, and, P, is PPSR easy or is it? I know you do oh, it day, I mean, day we, we do. I, yeah. I've gone onto the website and it's a bit befuddling to me personally. Yeah, but, we, 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 we've got our, our own account and um, we've got several accounts, but our, our team does it. Um, it, 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 is, it. It is, you need to understand how it works. Um, it, it's not too difficult. And, and the cost of actually registering on the PPSR is minimal. What, what's, mm -hmm. where, where the cost is and where the importance is, is in relation to that documentation and also the transaction. And as, as Tony mentioned, it's, it's extremely important in terms of, uh, say, loan documentation that if there are additional funds advanced, that um, either documentation manages that, um, but better, better, even better still, that you put new documentation and you update that PPSR position. Um, so, I mean, by, by securing uh, director shareholder loans, UPEs, it allows us, I mean, especially, especially from our Ventum Optum perspective, to to rank ourselves ahead or our clients ahead of um, creditors and predators such as ATO and other unsecured creditors. Uh, there's, there's certain dollar values in relation to that, but um, it means we've been able to get funds out to directors ahead of any ATO debt being paid, which is um, a fantastic good. position. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so, you know, in another area we saw, I know we're talking about uh, principal places of residencies before. Another yeah. area which, I mean, I saw as going through doing public practice and I, saw, and I still see a number of accountants even recommended is that uh, they talk about either joint tenants in common and Tony can probably jump in here as well and, or tenants in common. I mean, gen, joint tenants in common is where you have 50-50 ownership and then tenants in common, you can name percentages. I've, I've uh, uh, foolishly... In uh, years gone by, I've done uh, ten tenants in common held percentages where it's like one and ninety nine percent with my wife because I thought I'd maintain control and she wouldn't be able to sell it. The stupid thing is because that's, good. that's I, really good for family law. <laughs> yeah, well, the, stu the stupid thing is, and where we we get uh, and we find clients and we and they, they come and stuck is if your spouse is uh, on a lower income than yourself, and uh, which is in my circumstances, so mm. I'm obviously the main breadwinner. If I'm paying, regardless of right. coming out of a joint bank account, if I when the mortgage is paid, if I've got the majority of the funds and and it's coming out of a bank account, I'm actually building up equity each time, regardless of it saying one percent and ninety nine percent. So I might end up getting back to a fifty percent position anyhow. So we put into position um, mechanisms uh, to resolve that as well. So and uh, you've got to be very cautious that you're not actually buying equity back into the property unknowingly. That's correct, Michael. Correct. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for that, Michael. Um, we'll send out all these slides so everyone can look. Um, I just need to, for the last couple of minutes, I think, I'm just going to show you how to build a protector really quickly. Um, so obviously, you, 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 you know, everyone's interested in that. Uh, but as I said, it's look, I've got nine minutes. It's 10.51. So let's see how quickly we can go. I'm un un unlimited, so I don't have to worry about it. All I have to do is just put up here a protector. Um, and then that will popped up and so I'll go in I'll start the document I have to find a, obviously a folder um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a clean one I'm going to call it um, the Jeffries folder start to save that um, then I'm just going to start and you can see it's a pretty simple process now because I've set up a folder um, I'm going to uh, oops sorry I actually have to go and pick the folder now silly me so um, what I'm going to do is, there's the Jeffries folder, I start uh, and then what I'm going to do now is just work through the interview really quickly. So the main thing I need to know is the parties and also the net equity. So because it's in a folder, I'm going to put uh, Michael uh, Michael's uh, protector 
um, and we can use the either your internally or we can use the Abbott Morley logo, which is highly recommended. We put in the common party. So I'm going to have the individual um, here. So I'm going to have John, so I won't use Michael stuff, uh, five Smith, oops, Smith Street. And this is all going live. So just show you how quickly it can be done. Uh, 2000. Now, if I wanted to, now this is the person who's going to be doing the gifting. So this is the first one. So if I wanted to, I can add another person such as um, the spouse. Uh, but more importantly, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll add another now. Um, and that's going to be the trust. So I'm assuming here that I've got the Smith Family Protection Trust. And I'll go back and just change the typo. So sorry about that. If you've got any questions, uh, Michael is going to be there for us. So I'll just put in here as an individual. I don't actually know I'll use a I'll use a company as a trustee. So I'm going to use um, Smith these. And again, you want to have this quite separate from uh, any other trustee company you have. And you're fine with our leading member. The good thing is that uh, for the leading member or the, the key person who's the uh, appointor. Uh, if they resign, die, incapacitated, get divorced or whatever, they get binned. Um, but more importantly, their shares are cancelled uh, and the next person in line is the one who takes over. And that's really crucial out of that, that, uh, that whole process is building that line of succession. So here I've got a couple of directors. Um, I'll put in there. I'll put in there John Smith. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to put in his son, Max Smith, who's going to be the next person in line. So that would be the, the, the first success, much the same as Charles, um, is the next in line for the Crown, which is the same thing. So here's the selected documents. Do I want to establish a trust? I'm going to assume no. If I wanted to, I can do a yes, um, and then I can uh, pick up a trust pretty quickly. So it's a family protection or leading member. I do need to have a solvency certificate um, because I'm going to make a gift and you need to show your solvent. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, at, at the court, it's like, for example, I'm going to have a, a million dollar deed of gift, but if I'm not worth anything, it doesn't make any sense. Now, as I said before, promissory note, loan agreement, mortgage deed. If you really want to go over the top, might, you know, why not do personal guarantee to really make it um, out of it? Now, select a party. I haven't got a party here for the account, so what I'm going to do is Michael... Jeff Freeze, uh, firm name, Jam Investments. I think that's the case. Jam Investments, um, and then we'll put uh, five street sovereign. I, oops, can you say sovereign? Is that right? No. Sovereign Island. Queensland, um, I don't know what that is, two, what is that, four, or 900, who knows. Um, so let's go through the gifter. Now this is where it gets interesting. So who's the gifter? Um, all I do is select the party, it's John Smith. Who's actually gonna receive the gift? Um, well, that's easy, it's gonna be my trust, my family protection trust. I've already got that in there, so that's pretty easy, it's all pre-filled. Uh, the gift, remember I said, uh, I'll put in the date, you can leave the bl deed blank, but let's say I want to get it in a hurry, I'm going to put it in tomorrow, it's going to be in Queensland. The gift is going to be cash, um, so I could do UPEs or whatever. So when we look at this, remember I had, I think, $1.4 million. Uh, remember that original slide I had there? Uh, now, the promissor, because we need to do it by way of a promissory note, it's going to be the individual, pretty easy, it's John Smith. Um, the promisee, again, not that hard. I mean, we get a company, put it in there essentially, it's all filled. Details of execution, gonna do it tomorrow, so that's fine. It's gonna be under Queensland, the state or territory knows. Um, so the termination date should be carefully. I, I would do, you can actually put it in there on the death of the promisor if you want, or short dated. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it uh, long dated. So we've got there the fifth, uh, the 5th of June, uh, 2040, um, or earlier if the, um, uh, if the promissor dies. So we can go through that. So then we've got the promise details. Uh, what's the promise amount? Well, we've already talked about that. I don't need to put any details. 
Uh, will the promissory also be required a compensation payment? I would do that just for consideration. So it's always a compensation payment. Let's just go $10,000. Is there a late payment charge? Nope. Now we go down to the lender. Uh, the lender is obviously going to be the trustee of the trust. We've already got that in there as well, so it's okay. The borrower is pretty easy. That's going to be the individual because they want to use the assets. Um, so John Smith. So we go through that, the agreement, uh, the loan agreement. Uh, we're again going to do that tomorrow. We want to do this in a bit of a rush. Date of the commencement of the loan, same as the promise see. Uh, Queensland is the territory. Fixed rate, principal loan amount, obviously, is one for 000. Um, loan term, uh, 20 years. Oops, sorry. Just go through. 20 years. What's the commencement interest rate? We'll just go um, 0.2%. So that's okay. Interest payable at the end of the loan term. Deed of personal guarantee. Well, yeah, remember we said we wanted that, so we're going to do that in there as well. Is the guarantor the same as the borrower? borrower? Yes. Date of the mortgage deed. Yeah, okay, so we're going to do that. Uh, we've got uh, real estate here. Uh, I just want to show you actually something. Uh, what I'll do is I'll actually just change this to Brisbane. I just want to show you when I print it out. So this is going to be Queensland. That's for 4,000. So I'll just change that. And you can see actually, as I change that, um, everything else changes through the system. So that's how easy it is. Agreement details, um, I've got a mortgage. Uh, I'm gonna do it over real estate. Um, and then I need to put in the details of the property. So what's the folio number? L510540, that's okay. Um, the address, uh, 10 Brown Street. Uh, Broad Beach, Queensland, and um, then we go through for, I forget what it was, I used to live there anyway, 4898. Um, are there any additional terms and conditions uh, in terms of the mortgage? We can put whatever we want in there. I'm just going to go no. Uh, and that's it. So I then press um, finish, and I've got, well, there you go, that took me eight minutes. And I'm going to show you the pack anyway, um, so you can have a look. Just quickly, so just give me another two minutes and then we'll sign off. So what's doing now is all those documents are being processed um, and then what you do is you get them all in a line. And again, as we said right from the start, it's important to get it in a line so it fits exactly what you want. So we've got the protector there, Abbott Morley sign off. Uh, we've got our content solvency, duty gift, promissory note, loan agreement. You know, we've got the whole enchilada there. I mean, you can't get more security than that. Um, accountant statement of sol solvency. So Michael basically is saying that, you know, the, the gift of $1.4 million, uh, the client's solvent for that and, and can up the readies. So that's where you would put your details in there. So it's not for Michael, it's the accountant, if you're basically doing it. Then you've got the deed of gift between John Smith and also the gift deed being the Family Protection Trust. And again, it's a hard call. This is I want you, honestly, once you give a gift, and as whether it's UPE or cash or whatever, you can't take that gift back. So you've got to be very careful about that one. And we saw what happened in a tay around that. So then we've got to do a deed of promissory note. So because we haven't got cash all, or we're not doing um, shares, etc. So we do the promissory note. You can see there, uh, when I've gone through here um, and the promissory, it means that what I've done is I haven't pressed a button. So when you can see code there, I'm going to have to go back in. I'd have to relaunch and then just tick the, the right button. So obviously I didn't do that um, there. So again, you need to make sure you do everything. So you've got a deed of promissory note, and again, you can see um, here. Um, and then again, this is a this is just part of our normal promissory notes. We're using for minimum pension payments, for contributions, or just in between anyone. Uh, for example, Michael Papadre uses the same thing for a CGT exemption. Uh, loan agreement, there's your loan agreement. Again, it's stock standard straight over our, our um, uh, Abbott Morley uh, cachet of uh, documents. Again, it's pretty hardcore when we have a look at it. It's very detailed. Um, I've seen a couple of other ones on the market that are just like really basic loan agreements. Again, safe, certain, secure. We want to have the, the whole enchilada there. Um, so we've got that. Um, next one is obviously going to be the personal guarantee. Um, uh, sorry, that's all the T's and C's we've got there. Uh, $1.4 million. You can see I've just done all that. Portfolio. Got the personal guarantee. Um, and again, that goes all the way through. You can see obviously here, I've got the guarantor and the borrower, John Smith. 
Now, obviously, I have ticked that box well, and that's why you can see, well, the other one's not a coding error, it's just I've failed to tick that. So I've got a guarantor, uh, which again, just gives that extra layer of protection from my perspective. And then we go down to the mortgage deed uh, between Smith nominees, et cetera. Um, so we've got the asset there. Uh, we've got the, the property, uh, which is basically 10 Brown Street. Importantly from that one. Um, also the final one is because, uh, oops. Yeah, so the final one is because it's in Queensland and we are rolling this out. I know Tony's working really hard on it. Um, there we've got John Smith and we've got something that uh, then we can hand to the lawyer. And we've got a really good lawyers here in uh, Queensland once it's witnessed, uh, then we can take it to land registry office uh, and get that mortgage registered, which is absolutely crucial from that perspective. And that goes through all the details. So there you go, that was, so it took me 12 minutes. Not only do that to show you, but you really can't make a mistake with the execution on that one. Um, as I said before, look, this is uh, uh, available um, there. Uh, Daniel, how does the individual get the gift back? You don't, once the gift's done, um, effectively it is done. So it now means that, uh, for example, on the death um, of the uh, borrower, what will happen is the trustee of the trust, which will be the next person that in this one would be Max Smith would come in. He's the trustee, the next in line in that family protection trust and would call in that loan. Now that underlying asset, whether it's property, remember all those assets we had, property, shares, etc. The executor would hold those, but the first thing that an executor has to do is pay off all debts. So that would then go over to that family trust. So that's the way that it works. Again, if you've got any questions, please just uh, come to us, uh, support at lightyearcom.com.au or more importantly, tanamorlis at uh, abbotmorley.com.au. But I'll send this out to you when we get a little bit later on. But look, uh, look, I really appreciate with our, um, our stellar group um, of people there, like Tim at the front trenches. So thank you very much, Tim. Michael, with all your uh, PPSR, all that stuff, it's crucial. It's a bit beyond me, but look, uh, if there's any of those issues, Michael knows his stuff, and of course, Tony as well. So thank you all much for attending this deep dive um, on the protector. <laughs>